Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar sponsored by the Northwest ATTC, the Pacific Southwest ATTC, and the Western States node of the NIDA Clinical Trials Network. I'm Riley Vest, and I'll be your host for today. And we're very excited to have Dr. David Hodgins and Dr. Matthew Young talking to us today about the results of the first large-scale international project to develop lower-risk gambling guidelines. A quick couple housekeeping things. First, if you have any questions for Dr. Hodgins or Dr. Young during the presentation, you can put them in the chat and we will answer them throughout the presentation as well as after the talk. You'll also be getting an email at the end of today's webinar that has a link to a survey in it. And we ask that you please take that survey as it helps us to make sure we continue to bring content that you're interested in. That email will also have a link to download the slides from today and a link to the Northwest ATTC website where you'll be able to find a recording of the webinar later today as well. Additionally, when you registered for today's session, you marked the type of CE or CME credits you were interested in. For CME credits, you'll receive an email with instructions on how to log in to the Stanford CME portal, as well as some other instructions. And this slide just has some information about the CME accreditation. If you selected one of the types of CE credits, you'll receive an email shortly after the session with instructions on how to receive those. And all of this information is in the slide, so there's no need to write anything down right now. Those of you who requested a certificate of attendance will receive that automatically via email in about a week. Okay, so now on to the webinar. Today's speakers, Dr. David Hodgins, is a professor in the program in clinical psychology in the Department of Psychology, University of Calgary, and a coordinator with the Alberta Gambling Research Institute. He is registered at a, as a clinical psychologist in Alberta. His interests, research interests focus on various aspects of addictive behaviors, including relapse and recovery from substance and gambling disorders. Dr. Young is Chief Research Officer at Grio Evidence Insights, Senior Research Associate at the Canadian Center on Substance Use and Addiction, and an Adjunct Research Professor of Psychology at Carleton University in Ottawa. He has been working in the field of substance use, gambling, and addiction for almost 30 years, and along with Dr. David Hodgins, co-chaired the scientific committee who developed the world's first lower-risk gambling guidelines. Welcome, Dr. Hodgins and Dr. Young. Thank you very much. We're very, very pleased to be here. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, hold on here. It's all set up and ready to go. Okay, I just want to check and make sure that I my slides can be seen. Matthew, want to nod? Yes, we can see them. Okay. It's in presenter mode, though. Oh, it's in presenter mode. Okay. <laughs> How's that? Right. Okay. So yes, uh, yeah. No, we're very pleased to be here and uh, very happy to share the results of this uh, huge project that we were involved in for a number of years. And uh, it's been quite uh, rewarding just how interested people are really around the world. Um, even though this is a Canadian product, um, as you'll see, it was really um, developed based on international input. Um, so it has relevance. Uh, really you know, well beyond Canada as well. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna talk uh, first about what the guidelines are and how we develop them. And then Matthew is going to take over and talk about uh, some of the ways that we're disseminating them and some of the uptake of the guidelines in different places, including some places in the United States. Um, so why was this project necessary? Um, so, you know, I'm assuming that you know, people know that you know gambling is a legal activity, uh, but it's also not a, a typical ordinary commodity. Um, it really is similar to alcohol or cannabis in Canada. We can uh, um, you know, commercially buy cannabis, and unlike many projects, there's a risk of harm, and so we have to be thoughtful about how we provide it and the um, advice we give people about how to how to use it. Um, so 
gambling is very much in that 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 category. So in the in the last 30 or 40 years, since gambling has become very widely available, it's typically accompanied in some way with some advice on minimizing risk. And up until now, the types of advice has been uh, the types have been very general uh, because there hasn't been you know the ability to be more specific. So people who gamble are you know given the advice that they should um, you know set a, a time limit. They should you know set a, a dollar limit. They should only bet a money they they can afford. Uh, they should uh, take breaks and and so forth. So the question is, um, you know, can we can we be be more specific? And the advice has become more specific, but not specific like some of the other areas where there's a longer history of uh, public availability. So, for example, with alcohol, uh, different countries have different sets of guidelines, and these are some examples. Um, of the advice that the public has given in terms of you know what is you know reasonable amounts of alcohol to um, consume, and the amounts and the advice change over time as the science uh, accumulates over time. They become uh, refined and and more specific. So um, you know this is an example from Australia where. Um, I think it's uh, what is it? Uh, Fourteen, no, ten standard drinks a week um, is the advice. But you know, there's limitations. If you're pregnant, or um, you know, if you're uh, a young person, you should be drinking differently than this general advice. We have a new set of guidelines in Canada here on the left that are even more modest in terms of the advice they uh, provide Canadians based on. The research evidence that's available at this point um, with this latest iteration. So, you know, guidelines are, you know, generally evidence based and they're generally refined based on uh, greater evidence. Um, I mentioned that in Canada, we can now um, legally purchase cannabis for, for recreational use. And, you know, these are evidence based canna cannabis use guidelines. And uh, you know you can see on the right hand side the second bullet point is a piece of advice that you should limit and reduce how often you use cannabis. So that's pretty general, and that reflects, but that reflects the evidence that we have about cannabis, because we really don't know. Uh, we can't really say more than that. Um, we know that less is better, but we don't know um, the specifics of that at this point. Uh, so my assumption is that five years from now or 10 years from now, there'll be much more uh, specific levels of advice. So the question with gambling is, you know, are we at a point that we have enough evidence that we can be more specific? And in particular, can we provide some quantitative advice to people about what might be reasonable levels of gambling involvement? And so our project which unfolded over a number of years, really looked at that question. And we really concluded that, yes, there is um, evidence that we can you know, provide some reliable information uh, to people to guide their involvement with gambling. So this is what we came up with. Um, um, there's a couple of uh, pages or a couple of slides here that, that, that summarize it. And uh, we'll talk about how we come up with came up with these different components, sort of as we go along. But essentially, the quantitative part of it involves these three parameters: sort of how much money you're spending, and the advice is that you should gamble no more than one percent of your household income um, uh, per before tax before per month. Um, and uh, we provide a little sort of um, table to help people understand that because it's a, you know, a, you know, it's a hard concept to translate into your own personal situation. Um, how often you gamble. So the advice is to gamble no more than four days per month and um, to avoid gambling with more than two types of games. 
And again, we provide a little bit of information about what we mean by type of game. And it's kind of a category of game like slots versus you know, casino table games versus um, um, you know, sports betting, for example. And we also acknowledge that um, in the center here that the type of game actually makes a difference. So that lottery ticket play is um, less risky uh, but what's the most risky type of gambling are the fast paced games like slot machines, for example. And then on the bottom, we provide some uh, qualifiers. Um, so the same kind of information that you see in those drinking guidelines about who, sh who these may not apply to. And we know from some of the research review that we did is that uh, people who um, are experiencing other addictions, substance use addictions, people who are experiencing mental health issues like anxiety and depression in particular, and people with a personal or family history of gambling are at greater risk and should consider gambling even less than these general guidelines. We also provide some other sort of supplementary tips for safer gambling. Again, this is based on the literature um, and so it's things like limiting access to your money um, and scheduling activities that occur right after the time that you're gambling so that you need to you know, move away from gambling. You don't get kind of caught up and stuck with it and so forth. So there's a, you know, a set of those types of um, uh, tips as well, again, evidence-based. And um, we talk about the harms uh, associated with gambling, and you'll see why we include these particular harms um, from the research we did. And we also uh, you know, understand that motivations for gambling are important, and uh, people who are gambling to escape problems are at you know, stronger risk of developing gambling um, at these levels. So this is kind of the overall summary of the advice. Matthew later on will show you some of the dissemination materials that we've uh, developed to help different uh, organizations and public health institutes uh, disseminate these guidelines. Um, so in terms of, you know, how we did this, I, I mentioned that this was a long-term project. So it was a five-year international research project um, that was directed by a scientific working group that Matthew and I co-chaired. And ultimately the analysis, the quantitative um, risks curves that are uh, limits that we developed were based on uh, databases that included over 60,000 people who gamble across eight different countries, including the United States. And we also got feedback from um, Canadians and uh, lots of Canadians who gamble uh, from both online surveys and then some focus groups uh, that we conducted in English and in French across Canada. Um, so a little bit more kind of detail on how we developed them. I said that we you know, had a scientific working group that uh, directed the project that uh, the two of us uh, co-chaired. We also had a, um, a parallel advisory committee that was made up of stakeholders. Um, so clinicians, uh, people who gamble, regulators, uh, some people from industry and so forth that we kept apprised of the development, our, our progress towards developing guidelines throughout the project. And this was sort of an attempt, mostly I think for an, a sort of an integrated knowledge transfer type kind of involvement. So we wanted the people in different sectors to be engaged in, and sort of invested in kind of seeing what we were finding and seeing the um, quality of the work, I guess, that went into uh, developing the guidelines, um, as well as um, you know, getting some feedback as we went along on, 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 our, on our progress. Um, so we'll provide these slides to you and you can see the members of the scientific working group uh, that brought different types of expertise to the committee. Um, and you'll see that these are co-authors in some of the publications as well. Um, okay, so how they were developed. So we developed a plan that involved three phases. Um, first phase was to do this quantitative risk curve analysis to come up with 
the specifics of the guidelines. Um, the second phase was to validate those and refine them. So we wanted to you know, produce something that would, would be useful, that people would see as acceptable and directives that, that people would understand, that it was the public health messaging was clear. And then the third phase is of course implementation, um, which is the current phase of the project. We um, developed a, a, a research plan and we published the research plan. So this is a publication that's available and uh, I'll provide a web website link later on where you can access these publications. Okay, so phase one, the quantitative um, uh, analysis. So essentially the methodology that's used is risk curve, um, is, to, is, to, is to develop risk curves from available data. Um, the available data needs to be kind of very large, usually community-based surveys where people in the general public are asked about how much they gamble in some way and whether or not they're experiencing harms. And essentially, this is plotted against the, um, the, well, the gambling involvement along the bottom. So in this case, it's how many days per month are you gambling? And um, along the um, y-axis is the proportion of people that are um, experiencing harm at that level of gambling. And you can see that, you know, at lower levels, it's fewer people, and then ultimately at higher levels, it's higher people. So the question, the risk curve analysis then, looks to see where the, the tipping point is. And you could say that maybe it's at five, five times a month here, or maybe you could say it's at 13 um, um, times a month, uh, where the risk begins to increase um, more dramatically. And this is done empirically, it's not done through visual examination. But you know, when you look at this over the course, what we ch chose to do is look at this over different databases and different jurisdictions to see whether there's any consensus or commonality on where the tipping points are. And so we looked around the world to see where the best quality data are available that have the you know, necessary information to do this type of analysis. And uh, we found, um, data sets in eight different countries. Um, and we approached individuals associated with these data sets in the different countries. Everybody agreed actually enthusiastically to be involved. And we all did identical risk curve analysis on the data that was available. And you can see that there was some very good data in from Massachusetts that was included. We had a number of data sets from Canada and then a number from Europe and Australia, New Zealand, unfortunately, none from um, Asia or South America uh, or Africa. Um, so there is you know, a limitation from the data from that perspective, but it is international. So yeah, these are some of our collaborators. We brought the, them together to um, you know, work at the methodological details of how we would combine these very different data sets and um, when we looked at them, we found that all of them included uh, these three parameters of gambling involvement. So expenditure, which is you know, basically how much money a person spent per month, uh, how often they were gambling in a typical month, and then the different types of gambling that they were involved. Well, that was what we had available uh, consistently across the data sets. And then the next question is, what are we, we're predicting harm, but harm from what? Um, um, and we found, you know, all of the data sets included an instrument called the Problem Gambling Severity Index, which has a number of items that specifically ask about different types of harm. And uh, um, so we had indicators of financial harm, harm to relationships, emotional, psychological harm, and health harm that we were able to extract from all of the data sets. So everybody flew home and did these um, risk curve analysis and, uh, and, and you know, provided to us um, across their data sets, um, uh, the results. And uh, this is just two examples. We had, uh, well, many of these because of, we had so many parameters and so many data sets and uh, so forth. 
But this, for example, is from the United States, um, where um, this is the number of times gambled per month, and these are a number of the different um, indicators of harm. And what we found was when we looked at um, where the um, cut points were, these you know these tipping points, that there was a lot of consistency, actually amazing consistency across different data sets, across across different parameters, and across um, different um, um, indicators of harm as well. Um, so from that, we were able to uh, derive some broad lower risk ranges for some parameters that um, were, were consistent enough across data sets that we were comfortable saying that this, you know, this, you know, this seems to be reliably predictive of increased risk of harm. Um, and you know these are the broad ranges, and um, again you'll get these data sets if you want to kind of look into this. But um, you know we had two indicators of expenditure, exactly how much they were spending, and then what proportion of income that was. And so you can see it's one from one to three percent of income, uh, frequency five to eight days per month, three to four types of gains in a month, and then we tried to look at duration of um, of gambling, how long people were spending per gambling session. We just didn't find that that was a reliable indicator. Um, so the next step then having these with these broad ranges was how do we refine them um, and see if uh, they fit and you know uh, can be more specific. And so we um, had each of our partners, international partners, look at where the risk of harm, how these broad ranges uh, correspond with increasing risk of harm across the gambling parameters. And um, so here you can see this is, you know, we had this one to 3%, which is across the top here. I don't know if you're seeing my arrow or not, but um, um, you can see that that's kind of, you know, generally where the red range um, starts. So this, help validate um, that these broad ranges were, were good and gave us a beginning sense of how we might refine these. And then we took a number of different steps. We you know, commissioned uh, a couple of um, literature reviews on different specific issues, uh, like what is the effect of substance use on gambling behavior? And then what are the factors that might be um, associated with elevated risk beyond how much you're gambling, like mental health problems or substance abuse problems. And then we uh, participated in an online survey of uh, people who gambled in Canada, 10,000 uh, 10, people, uh, where we asked people to tell us uh, what they did to limit their gambling. And what we learned is that people do set limits and they do think in advance about uh, how much they're gambling, uh, how much time and how much money they're gambling. So that validated the idea of lower risk gambling. And we also were able to present them with uh, some of these early results to see whether they felt like they were you know, too conservative or too liberal or just about right and different ways of wording them so that they could understand them and so forth. So we had a number of different um, ways that we uh, refined the information. And then we followed that up with some focus groups where we did uh, groups or um, qualitative interviews across Canada, again, to get feedback on what we were coming up with and how acceptable um, and uh, understandable and applicable uh, the ranges were. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, we did take a, an approach to publishing things scientifically. And um, there's a website uh, link that will give you a summary of this. And there are um, this original research plan and then a number of different uh, publications that summarize the survey results from the 10,000 people, the qualitative interviews, uh, the meta-analysis, the literature review that we did uh, that we conducted that helped us understand what the qualifiers are, um, 
and then you know the overall description of our process and the results and uh, there's a technical uh, uh, report that uh, people who are interested can look at all of the details of what we've provided and uh, and then this is kind of our final kind of summary publication of, of the results and this has just been recently published um, there have been some follow-up studies as well and so the uh, the uh, references are here for those um, as well um, and this is the website and you'll get these slides so you don't have to copy this down okay so i'm going to uh with that quick summary of how we came up with the guidelines i'm going to pass it to matthew to talk about uh knowledge mobilization matthew yeah thank you david so yeah um so when we when we released the guidelines we then um thought about uh, we did a lot of work to try and uh, determine how best we can get them into the hands of people who can use them and uh, so i'm going to take you through a lot of the materials and some of the ways that people have used them and and the, and the kind of the, the things that people have done with them since their release it's been um this month it will have been two years since their release um so they're they're fairly new um but uh i'll i'll show you what we've we've found so far so next slide please so as you can see, the, 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 uh, uh, David took you through this in detail, so I won't do that again. But uh, th there's one poster that kind of summarizes um, the, the guidelines in, a, in a basically the, that if there's, any, if there's one thing that you want to refer to in terms of when you're explaining to people uh, what the guidelines are, this poster would be that. Everything, um, everything that I'm showing you here is available for download on a website, uh, www wgamblingguidelines.ca. Um, they're all um, free to use. Um, we encourage people to, if who want to engage in co-branding, um, if your local public health unit or uh, local hospital wants to uh, promote these, um, they're, 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 uh, they're it's strongly encouraged to uh, adapt them to some of your own branding um, requirements um, and and really use them in some of your materials. So these are um, are very much um, in the public space and available for for uh, for use. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the things you'll find on the website um, is a number of other kinds of posters that describe different aspects of the guidelines. So one of the things that we found in some of our focus groups and interviews is that uh, people didn't really get what we meant by lower risk of gambling harm. So as, as some of you who may uh, know the literature on alcohol, for a long time, we thought um, as people working in health that the only harm that arose from alcohol was alcoholism or, or alcohol uh, ad addiction to alcohol. But we know now um, through a lot of research that shows that, that that's just simply not true, that we, there's a whole host of cancers of the digestive tract, there are acute injuries, there is a violence. There's a lot of risks that come along with drinking alcohol that are associated with um, alcoholism or alcohol addiction, but um, but also occur uh, among a great many people who don't engage in alcohol use um, in that kind of a, a compulsive type way. Um, what we do know is that uh, gambling is very similar. So uh, even though somebody may uh, may not necessarily be suffering from a gambling problem or disordered gambling, um, there are harms that are associated with gambling that do hit people who do not, uh, who do not meet the, the clinical definition of a disordered gambler. Um, and these uh, are not necessarily known to the public and not necessarily known to people in our focus groups. So this poster here kind of takes people through what those harms are. Um, so as you can see here, we talk about losing money is the gambling harm that first comes to mind, but gambling can also lead to other harms, relationship conflicts, emotional distress, or health problems, and then reminds one of the, of the gambling guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other thing that's really important, and this is something that David uh, alluded to um, when he talked, uh, uh, went through the main poster, but um, it's really uh, critical in when we think about gambling is that um, when you are gambling, what you play matters a great deal. Uh, we know that there are some forms of gambling that are associated with greater risk and some that are associated with less risk. Uh, 
Um, what our results have indicated is the main reason for this is because some forms of gambling are uh, more conducive to people gambling more frequently and spending more um, on that uh, activity than others. So if you think about uh, um, uh, lottery play, for example, um, there is a kind of a lot of time between draws. There are, um, so there's a natural pacing to the lottery experience. Um, if a lottery was, um, if you were able to spend money on a lottery ticket, immediately know the outcome and then put more money down, suddenly that would become, that that activity as a lottery would become more, uh, a greater risk of harm. So what this poster really talks about is that when, when you gamble, it's really important to think about the kinds of activities that you engage in when you gamble, because your choice of activities will make it harder uh, easier or more difficult to adhere to um, that what is recommended in the lower risk gambling guidelines. Next slide, please. Um, this uh, final poster uh, in terms of the poster suite um, is really uh, dedicated to talking about um, how there are certain people who may be at more risk of gambling related problems. And these guidelines may, uh, may um, People who, who 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 fit these conditions might consider gambling less than the guidelines recommend or not at all. And specifically, we know uh, from our uh, uh, meta um, our systematic review and meta analysis of over 250 studies that if somebody experiences um, anxiety or depression, uh, problems from alcohol, cannabis, or drug use, have a personal family history of problems with gambling or gambles to escape problems, that these are um, factors that might might mean that these guidelines may not be uh, be for you. Um, next uh, slide, please. Um, the other thing we have available is uh, the, a few uh, banner ads that can uh, uh, highlight, uh, identify, if you don't mind hitting the play button there, David. Um, so these were developed uh, in order to um, just promote the guidelines when they came out. Um, they were mainly shown in, uh, in Canada uh, mainly in the province of Quebec, but uh, uh, they're available. Uh, next slide, please. So there's there's three of these. Um, yeah, there's three three of these banner ads that can be um, that can be used, highlighting different parts of the guidelines. And the last one. Um, we also have available on the website um, some um, some content that is already developed for these uh, formats, for these social media formats, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, if there's any interest in promoting or, um, or, or, uh, or uh, sharing uh, some of the guidelines. Next slide, please. So um, we also have on the website, we developed the guidelines. Um, we developed the guidelines into a tool to allow um, to be able to provide pe personalized feedback to people at Gamble. So uh, next slide, please. So um, we call it the lower risk gambling guide, uh, lower risk gambling self-assessment tool. And so what it does is it asks a series of questions. Next slide, please. Um, about the, the kinds of games somebody regularly engages in, uh, as well as how much money they spend um, on those games. Next slide, please. Um, and then provides feedback to the person inputting the information. Um, so in this case, um, the feedback to the person would be based on the number of gambling types you regularly play. Your risk of gambling related harm harms is almost three times higher than someone who doesn't gamble very much. Next slide, please. Um, and then also coming out of this, there's also the ability to calculate um, what the person's percentage household income that they spend on gambling is. And then uh, next slide, please. There's also some uh, ability to give feedback to the individual about whether or not um, they gamble in excess of the guidelines, and if so, uh, how that affects their risk of gambling-related harm. 
Uh, next slide, please. There's also the ability at the end to kind of have a, a summary of all of their gambling behavior and to uh, um, and whether or not uh, the different aspects of their gambling behavior um, are uh, in excess of that recommended by the guidelines or um, or not. And uh, this is available in a printable sheet that somebody could use if they're they're interested in accessing their own uh, assessing their own uh, gambling. Um, this information is not. Uh, it's not um, recorded in any way on on the server, so this information is not uh, it's completely anonymous, and it's uh, not the the responses to the survey are not stored anywhere. So this is a completely confidential tool that people can uh, can use. Next slide, please. Um, so now I'll take you through a little bit of uh, some of the activities that have been uh, some of the groups that have used the guidelines. Um, so next slide, please. So first, I'll take you through some of the Canadian groups. So uh, this has been promoted on the um, the regulator the, uh, in the in the province of Manitoba, Canada, and they uh, they uh, the regulator there uh, regulates uh, gambling, uh, alcohol, and cannabis, and includes all three of the uh, public health guidelines on their website. Next slide, please. And uh, here's uh, just a little bit more about from that from that slide. Um, do do you set limits? And then where where can uh, where can you find out a little bit more? Next slide, please. Next. Um, in Saskatchewan too, there are some provincial resources through the the Gambling Awareness Program that talk a little bit about the guidelines. And as you can see here. Uh, this is a good example of, a, of an organization that's taken the guidelines and adapted them uh, to their own branding and their own um, so that they it will it can be folded into their own promotional activities. Um, and that's something certainly that uh, that we uh, encourage and hope that uh, people will do. Next slide, please. Uh, British Columbia, Canada is another another one um, that is uh, from the, the, the gambling uh, problem line. Next. Um, there's an area in, in Windsor, Canada, that uh, the public health unit there actually went and and, uh, and printed some very large posters and put them outside some um, some um, convenience stores that that, uh, that sell gambling um, uh, activities, so sort of slot machines and uh, and lottery tickets and scratch cards and things like that. Next slide, please. It's another example of a poster. Next slide, please. Um, one of the biggest uh, groups in the United States that has done a lot of work is the Massachusetts Gaming Commission printed up a, uh, a pamphlet and uh, that they distributed um, uh, and lantern cards and uh, distributed to the casinos and talked a little bit about uh, want to keep your gambling fun. Um, and they talk about the 421 guidelines um, that can increase your chances. Next slide, please. Also, some of the uh, game sense advisors, the uh, people that uh, wander through the uh, casino, uh, trying to uh, uh, educate some people about uh, about gambling, uh, have these posted onto their uh, the, their shirts, um, and uh, they've indicated that it's a good uh, conversation starter. People say, "What do you mean by four two one?" Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, Minnesota, the Minnesota Alliance. Of Problem gambling have uh, have have shown have uh, have posted information about the low risk gambling guidelines on their website. Next slide, please. Um, we've also seen some uh, uptake of the guidelines um, outside of North America as well. Um, so this is the uh, this is in uh, New Zealand. Next slide, please. Um, Australia also the, the the New South Wales government um, um, featured the gambling guidelines about uh, three rules to help you set your limits. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, more for New Zealand. Next slide, please. Um, and some others have used the guidelines too. There's uh, a lot of interest for the Canadian National uh, Department of National Defense. Um, also, the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare is doing some work right now to adapt the guidelines um, 
and the language used in the guidelines for the Finnish population. Um, and we do know of other or international organizations that are investigating use of the guidelines um, as well. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about another uh, use of the guidelines, and this is as a, a population measure for use in gambling prevalence studies. So uh, next slide, please. One of the things that we, we oftentimes find, uh, I'm not sure how much of the audience is familiar with uh, problem gambling prevalence surveys, but we oftentimes will look at um, the number of people or the proportion of the population that gambles. And then uh, and then another indicator that we use in, uh, in looking at the epidemiology of gambling is the proportion of the population that meet the criteria for uh, problem gambling. And those tend to be uh, quite... Uh, large gap between the two. So how many people gamble and then a very small proportion of the population meet the meet the criteria for problem gambling. Uh, what we're thinking in the, the lower risk gambling guidelines and uh, is to use this as another um, indicator that can be used to kind of describe how many, well, the percentage of the population, both the total population, but also among people that gamble, who gamble in excess of the guidelines. It's just another sensitive uh, indicator that can speak to uh, what a, uh, that can provide an indication of the extent of gambling and risky gambling within a population. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of how it could be written up within a within a, a, a report talking about um, how um, the proportion of the population that gambles in excess of the guidelines. Next slide, please. Um, there are also, um, so this was one that, uh, in Finland, they have been actually used and published some materials looking at how the low risk gambling guidelines have been used as a population measure of gambling, uh, of risky gambling uh, prevalence. Um, and so this was a, uh, a, a uh, an abstract that was used at uh, a local uh, a recent conference that was held in uh, Banff, Alberta. Next slide, please. So um, that's kind of the, the the majority of what we wanted to show you today. Um, in terms of future directions, I can let you know a little bit about what we're thinking about right now is um, uh, the low risk gambling guidelines were developed in the low risk alcohol guidelines model. And one of the things that has um, changed a little bit, at least in the Canadian uh, alcohol guidance model, is the idea of talking about um, instead of suggesting an actual value and saying uh, don't uh, gamble more than X amount, instead of uh, providing um, more of a uh, discussion or information, providing information to the public about uh, about risk zones and how as you engage in more and more gambling, your risk of gambling related harm goes up. And um, there's some indication that that's a much more complicated message to use in public health uh, guidelines, but there, for, for some individuals who may be more apt to uh, react to being told where a line is and, and in, uh, there, there may be value in educating the public just about how one's risk of harm goes up as their gambling involvement increases. Um, there's also some work underway right now uh, that uh, David and I are both involved in, in trying to um, find some, uh, uh, to, to uh, get some dollars to develop a framework for evaluating lower risk gambling guidelines uh, because as more and more people begin to use them, uh, there will be questions about, you know, how 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 effective are they in reducing gambling related harm in the population? Uh, what are the uh, variables that influence um, the implementation of the guidelines and things like that? Um, one of the things that has been a little bit challenging in the in in releasing the lower risk gambling guidelines is that in many jurisdictions uh, in North America, certainly in Canada, but uh, North America and uh, around the world, is that there frequently tends to be um, a large amount of kind of, I would frame it as maybe conflicts of interest in the sense that many times it is the organizations who um, are, who profit from gambling revenue that are also tasked with doing some of the public health surrounding um, 
surrounding gambling harm reduction. And um, this is different than it is in, in, the, in the alcohol field as well as in the cannabis field. Um, it's something that has always been the case in, in the gambling field um, and, um, and, is, and is a challenge when one is talking a little bit more about uh, where the message is to reduce your consumption of, 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 of gambling, uh, which can be interpreted by some uh, for-profit organizations as reducing the amount of people that use your product. Um, so this has been just, I, I think, has been a bit of a challenge in getting uh, the, the uptake to take place. Um, the other challenge has been um, that a lot of times people working in public health don't really appreciate um, how gambling related harm can affect uh, the people um, that, are, that are within their population. Um, and uh, because we don't have really good uh, measurement tools to measure the amount of gambling harm at the population level. We don't, very few jurisdictions have good measures of how many, um, how many suicides may have, or that to which, um, how many suicides may have gambling involvement in, in those, in those suicides, how many bankruptcies may be associated with the gambling, um, et cetera. So, um, so this is, uh, so um, next slide, please. I believe that's everything I, um, so, yeah, so I really appreciate, uh, on behalf of David and I, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to to spend with us today and hear about uh, the project. And we just welcome any kind of questions or uh, comments that you have. Thank you so much, Dr. Hodgins and Dr. Young. Um, I do have, we don't have very many questions. I think you were very thorough in your presentation. Um, I do have one, though. And as people start to formulate questions and put them in the chat, I have this question for you. In the U.S., we have seen a huge increase in the availability of sports betting, both in person and online. First, what do you want the audience to know about this type of gambling? And second, what may be the implications of your work on this type of gambling? Uh, I'll take a stab, Matthew, and then you can jump in. Um... I mean, it's it's um, sports betting having been kind of legalized and sort of widely promoted sort of brings a new audience um, to to gambling. And, you know, that's always a concern. Um, so the more people that are involved with gambling, the more people who will experience harms. So I think we need to we should be approaching that with our eyes wide open and sort of understanding that there are there are implications for that. Um, you know, the analysis that we've done to create these guidelines, you know, we found that um, because people tend to be involved, the more a person gambles, the more likely they are to be involved in multiple types of gambling, that the, ga the guidelines that we developed are generally for, for, for gambling um, of, of all types. And, you know, we have the qualifiers that certain types might be more risky, but it, it's really aimed, aimed at people thinking about their entire involvement with gambling. Now, how that applies to sports betting, you know, is, a, you know, a question that is deserving of some, some research attention um, because, it, you know, gambling is always evolving. And uh, with uh, the evolution of sports betting, it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, new, a new direction. So I, I, you know, I think there's work to be done there, but the indications are that you know this advice is good advice that would apply um, to uh, sports betting as well as other types of gambling. You know, one of the issues that um, the sports betting evolution has raised is the impact of advertising, um, and you know, certainly in Canada, and you know, I think in different states in the U.S., there have been there's been a lot of concern about the amount of advertising and the approach to advertising um, where I you know sports figures are used to promote gambling and uh, um, you know, the uh, likelihood of winning is uh, inflated and uh, and so forth um, and then um, um, you know so that's that's one concern the other concern is that um, there's a, a distinction between, gambling on the outcome of sporting events and gambling uh, during games on different, you know, 
inline uh, gambling during sporting events. And if you think about what we've been saying about different types of gambling having different levels of risk, the type of gambling that, that you can do during a game is much more similar to like a slot machine where you're getting, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a rapid type of gambling. And so it's that aspect of sports betting that um, is probably the most concerning um, in terms of its ability to increase risk of harm. Yeah, I, I agree with everything David said, and I might add a few things too. I think that, and somebody I just noticed talked about youth in there. This is a challenge too, right? Because most regulators, gambling regulators, have rules that prevent the targeting of adver gambling advertising to youth. But we know that a lot of youth are really into sports. And so, I mean, I don't need to put one and one together and tell you that it equals two. We know that a lot of advertising is getting in, is, is, is getting to youth, and we don't really know the impact that that's going to have. Um, the other thing that is associated with that, too, is that um, one of the things we know about sports betting is that there is that a lot of the branding and the marketing is really geared to try and create a more of a relationship between the fan and the, and the game. And to the point where it becomes kind of integral with this, like that, that, that gambling is just part of sport. And we know that in that way, um, that the, the, uh, the, the, the gambling companies are kind of almost riding on the healthy aspect of sport to kind of to work with the, to, 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 and to pair their, their, uh, their product with that kind of very, um, healthy pro social, um, uh, brand of of sport. Um, yeah, and I think I think uh, that's that's all I have to say about that for now. I think yeah. Perfect. Thank you for that. The next question we have for you is: Do you have any data on correlation between SUD and gambling? Yeah. Well, actually, one of the. Uh, 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 literature reviews that we conducted was specifically focused on uh, gambling and substance use, um, substance use and substance use disorders. And what we found was um, two things. Uh, we found that there's a lot of information from prevalence surveys on the association between gambling disorder and substance use disorders. And they're, you know, very, there's high comorbidity. It's, it's very clear. And um, you know, something like 80% um, of people with gambling disorder have a, um, another disorder, either mental health or substance use. Most of those are substance use. So they're very highly uh, comorbid. Well, what we also found in that literature review is a gap in, in understanding. And that's is that there's actually surprisingly little research on the influence of using substances while gambling. There's certainly some of there's some, uh, but really less than you would expect there to be, given that you know casinos serve alcohol for the most part, and you know um, decision making processes are um, an important part of gambling and are affected by alcohol use and uh, so forth. So we have less information about that um, association, but it's very clear that. Uh, uh, the comorbidity is very high between substance use disorders and gambling disorders. Yeah, and maybe to add to that, and some of the motivations for use uh, can be very similar. Um, some of, like, if you look at craving among people who, uh, who experience gambling problems, one of the biggest predictors of, of problematic gambling is craving to for a release or a relief from negative affect, which is very similar to what we see among people with substance use disorders. Is that they it's not it's it's not so much the uh the 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 uh uh the kind of the buzz they get from the substance but it's the relief from just base level negative affect or neg negative um from their day-to-day -day negative affect that, that, that is some one of the biggest reinforcers we notice the same thing in gambling and one thing though that i might kind of just draw um, a distinction with substance use disorders is we know that people who use substances can experience um, acute injuries and overdoses and things like that. Um, 
We also know that in gambling, if somebody goes on a vendor, they can lose their entire life savings and their family's life savings in a in a, in a weekend. And that can have devastating effects uh, for a very long period of time, even if they immediately stop their gambling uh, right right then and there. So it's 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 interesting to to think about the comparisons, but there's also some distinctions as well. Perfect. Thank you. We have a, a couple questions here uh, in one question, if that makes sense. So I'll, I'll read this for, for you from the chat. Have studies found any incremental associations between gambling and post-confinement? So we'll let you answer that one first. Um, so we were, you know, very curious, of course, about the impact of the uh, shutdown uh, of gambling um, availability that occurred in you know lots of countries around the world and its impact on 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 people gambling and the particular concern was it kind of related to the second part of this question I think which was uh, online gambling didn't cease it was really land based gambling that people couldn't access. Um, and so would this, you know, encourage a migration to online gambling? And the concern there is that online gambling is more highly associated with problematic gambling and with gambling disorder. Um, and uh, that's partly related to the fact that it's just incredibly accessible. You know, it's available 24-7 um, and you know, we don't have the, um, the social kind of... Um, influences that might limit somebody's gambling um, um, and so you know people can get can get quite involved with gambling so um, if you uh, survey people who are who gamble online more of them have gambling problems than people who only go to land-based casinos so there's a lot of concern about this and um, and there was some you know in some jurisdictions there was a little bit of evidence for increased migration but it wasn't really as as um, large as the concern, um, and uh, there have been fewer studies that have now looked at the impact, uh, you know, post confinement. Uh, but generally, the shift, at least in Canada, the shift has been back to kind of um, you know the way gambling was before the the, the confinement. Um, so yeah. Stop there. I don't know if Matthew has anything to add. No, I, I mean, I, I think just to, we do know that um, surveys of people experiencing different kinds of mental health distress have increased, certainly in Canada. I'm sure that's the same in the United States. And so when that happens, we know that there's greater people at risk of substance use disorders, gambling, things like that, because they'll they'll seek kind of relief in from in in those behaviors, short term um, relief, and so that's certainly a concern. When at the same time, as we come out of the pandemic and and an increase in mental health challenges and people also having uh, uh, you know inflation and things like that, and then at the same time being kind of um, presented with a, a huge amount of advertising. Um, that's that's a concern that we have here uh, in Canada. Certainly, um, we haven't yet seen the data, so we don't know if, um, if if that concern is warranted or not. Thank you. Um, uh, the other question in this question is: Would there be any relationship in the future due to greater digitalization in daily life and the virtual world promoted, for example, by Meta, with the higher incidence of gambling in virtual reality? I uh, short answer would be yes. I mean, again, it's related to accessibility um, in part. Um, it just you know it makes it you know very very accessible. Um, one of the um, uh, sort of more recent concerns, though, is is the uh, convergence of video gaming and gambling. So, um, ga uh, video games have increasingly incorporated gambling-like features into their product, um, 
And so again, it, you know, it's a way of a way that young people in particular are introduced um, to gambling. Um, but you know, it, it it sort of becomes increasingly central to the video game. So the you know best example of that is uh, is a loot box. Um, so the people have the opportunity to spend money or you know um, something of value on um, the opportunity to win different um, features of, for their players or you know different levels of uh, achievement and so forth. And um, you know, I, you know, as somebody who doesn't play video games, I sort of interpret this as, you know, a literally a little, you know, treasure, um, treasure chest that would open and, you know, it's like a little lottery kind of thing. And that exists, but more, more of them are really starting to look like slot machines. And, you know, you wager your money and, you know, the wheels turn and, um, you know, you have the opportunity to win. So there's sort of, so, the, so there's a lot of concern about that both as a, you know, an entryway into gambling for young people and also just another way that, you know, sort of gambling becomes accessible and part of our everyday life um, as well. It's a, you know, it's an evolving field um, and, uh, uh, you, know, you know, it's hard to predict what, what the next direction will be in terms of how gambling will infiltrate our day-to-day uh, -day lives. Okay, um, the a next, another question or the next question is, how has the policy that those in charge of policing gambling problems are the ones that profit off of it in, evolved? How has the policy evolved? I, I don't think anybody sat down and, 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 and decided that would be the best way for it to happen. I think it's more of a, a, a kind of a, it's more of a, a move towards self-regulation by industry self-regulation. Um, I think that, you know, if you look at a lot of, a lot of people for a very long time saw the, the gambling industry as being more similar to uh, the movies and, uh, and, and, and the hospitality industry um, and less similar to, you know, alcohol cannabis. Um, I think that growing evidence suggested that, that they, they do, it is uh, it is a much more accurately uh, to see them um, as just another one of those legal but uh, products that are can be associated with harm uh, that we need to regulate and carefully and take uh, and take seriously from a public health perspective, right? So, um, so I think it's more of just like that's how it kind of has evolved. Um, speaking in Canada. Some of that also just came from that also to the, the different provinces in Canada uh, kind of provide and manage gambling at the provincial level. Um, so I, I think it's I think it's more of an evolution than a thoughtful plan. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, um, and now the, the challenges in the public health space is like, you know, we, we 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 in Canada and in the U.S. have a lot of our people in public health. Um, just at the tail end of a pandemic, dealing with the health issues there. Um, there is an opioid epidemic. Um, there's there are just uh, in, in the United States, there's a, a mosaic of laws surrounding the legalization of cannabis or not. And I just think that because gambling had not been on public health's radar for a very long time um, and other people were tasked with doing some of that work, that it's just kind of stayed like that. Um, there is a big move in some countries, uh, Australia and the UK um, are really um, pushing back against um, this way of doing things. Um, in fact, uh, there's, a, there's a huge movement against the, what has been referred to as uh, the responsible gambling narrative. So we, we do know that many of the people in the gambling uh, industry use a the term called responsible gambling. So gamble responsibly here's and, and and the promotion is really about that and that has been criticized by some especially in Australia and the United and the United uh, Kingdom as taking the onus off the providers who are delivering the product and putting it solely on the individual um, so if somebody does encounter problems then obviously they're not gambling responsibly and it's their fault so there is there's a lot of movement and a lot of politics that are going on 
in this space. And some of it is a reaction to exactly the question that you, you had, like how, ha how has it, how, how can it be that the people in charge of, of promoting public health in a space that sells an inherently dangerous product can be also placed on the individuals who, who are, who are profiting from that product. And there's no easy answer and it probably just resides in local policy history. But uh, but it's it's not it's not un uncommon in Canada and North or in North America in general. Thank you, um, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Does anybody else have any questions? And if you do, could you please put them in the chat right now? We'll give you just a minute. Someone was asking about our contact information, and that is available on the slides when you access the slides. If uh, you have further comments or questions, uh, the contact information is there. Perfect. Um, well, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Young and Dr. Hodgins, for um, your presentation. And uh, we hope to hear from you again soon. OK, well, thank, thank you, you very you so much. much. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. and. Uh, Excellent comments and questions. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Please reach out. Anybody have any questions?